if you are following my biochem playlist in order, you must already have finished our fatty acids discussion and then followed by our coverage on all the saponifiable lipids, leaving us with the non-saponifiable lipids to cover for here. Reminder that when you say saponifiable lipid, it's a lipid that has no fatty acid. We start first with the fat-soluble vitamins, and they are four primarily, vitamins A, D, E, and K, and they have their unique uses, each of them. Just as a side note, whenever we use the word vitamin, it basically refers to something which our body needs for whatever reason, usually a certain biochemical process, but we should get from food or other external sources like food supplements because we cannot make them on our own. An equivalent adjective of the word vitamin, well, since vitamin is a noun, an adjective that's almost like vitamin in terms of definition is essential. So, for example, whenever we use the word essential, for example, I have the word essential amino acid. It means it's an amino acid, whatever an amino acid is, that we need for certain bodily functions, but we cannot make on our own, so we need to get them from food. Something like that. Now, let's go into the four main fat-soluble vitamins. Well, actually, there are really just four of them anyway. Vitamin A comes in many oxidation states. As the alcohol, we have retinol. As the aldehyde, retinol. And as the acid form, retinoic acid. And regardless of the oxidation state, you notice that all of them have the prefix retin, which you can correlate with the retina. Hopefully, you're familiar that the retina is a part of the eye. So that's the clue. And it's actually well known that we need uh, ample amounts of vitamin A in our system such that our eye would function uh, quite well. In some cases where people have a significant deficiency of vitamin A, it will result to you know, light, night, night blindness because there is a lack of pigment that, that requires vitamin A that helps us see things, that helps our eyes receive light properly. Okay. Next, we have vitamin D, which has something to do with the bones, and uh, we'll try to correlate that in a while. Generally, most vitamin D um, molecules have the root word calciferol, and from the prefix calci, it has something to do with calcium, particularly calcium absorption. For humans and animals, the main type of calciferol is colicalciferol, and Colicalciferol increases our capability to absorb calcium. Going back to the bones, isn't it that, well, I think a lot of uh, people know this even uh, early on, uh, that bones are primarily made of calcium. So if my vitamin D improves calcium absorption from the food I take, then that means that's potentially more calcium for my bones, making my bones stronger. In fact, if a person has diagnosed low vitamin D levels for a consistent period of time, that will eventually result to bone disease. Okay? Vitamin E, or our tocopherols, are well-known antioxidants. And long story short, they basically protect our body from so-called oxidative stress. But uh, this is quite a wide-scoped... Um, Topic. So we're not gonna gonna uh, break down the implications of ox oxidative stress for now. Also, I want to take note. I want you to take note that vitamin E is not the only antioxidant out there. We have glutathione. We have vitamin C. In natural products, we have uh, things called um, flavonoids and and many more. So I'm just saying that vitamin E is one of the many antioxidants that we can take in from food. Now, vitamin K has a lot of forms also, but uh, some of the more popular ones are phytomenadione and menachinone. And, uh, well, in general, I think you could use the prefix mena for easier memorization. And vitamin K has a lot to do with coagulation. So maybe if you're willing to make a wrong spelling here just for the sake of remembering this faster, then K for coagulation. And that is because vitamin K helps us in the synthesis of certain clotting factors. If you have an idea of how blood clotting takes place, you should have, uh, you should have remembered that it happens in the form of a cascade. 
So one clatting factor needs to be activated to activate another clatting factor which will activate another and that will go on and on and on. So you can just imagine if I have a lot of factors that are absent, then the coagulation cascade would not happen as efficiently. And vitamin K is critical for that said coagulation cascade. So that's it for the fat-soluble vitamins. And now let's go to the terpenoids or the isoprenoids. Honestly, it's very hard to discuss all of them because if you go into the study of natural products, terpenoids include a super, super large family of so many different compounds. Needless to say, I can only give you the basic idea in this recording. So in general, these thousands and thousands of molecules are derivatives of what we call isoprene. So I've already drawn isoprene here. It's basically a 5-carbon compound with double bonds in it. And basically, terpenoids are assemblies of many isoprene molecules. So one thing that we can use as a general guideline is that whenever you say you have a single terpene, it's equivalent to two isoprenes that are connected in some way. So when I use the word monoterpene, I'm referring to a terpenoid with two isoprenes or, well, two isoprenes times five carbons. That would be ten carbons total. Or sesquiterpene, sesqui is one and a half, so that's one is to two, so one and a half is to three. Three isoprenes times five, 15 carbons. Diterpene, di means two, so one is to two, two is to four, that's the ratio in proportion. Or 4 times 5 is 20 carbons, tri is 3, 3 times 2 is 6, 6 times 5 is 30, and so on. Actually, the, the uh, most well-known of the longest, I mean, the, the terpenoids, which are longest so far, that are popular are the tetraterpenes. So if you compute that, that's 8 isoprenes or 40 carbons. Examples of terpenoids, and I added uh, some medicines here, just because those are things I thought of first include volatile oils, which basically give up the odor of rose or um, what else, or, or lemon, and a lot of pleasant odors you can think of in plants and fruits. Artemisinin, which is a popular drug for malaria, in fact, uh, the choice drug for malaria right, right now. Taxol, which is one of the older, well-known anti-cancer drugs. And scoline, which we're gonna use to link to our last topic, why? Because choline is a precursor of what we call sterols. Sterols are terpenes that possess a so-called CPPP backbone, wherein if you really want to, to recite the meaning of CPPP, this will stand for cyclopentanoperhydrophenanthine. And notice for, well, at least for our students, they just memorize this for the fun of it, but we can use logic to make sense of this long word, uh, if you know what phenanthrene looks like, it's this one. So what's perhydrophenanthrene? Whenever you use the prefix perhydro in organic chemistry, it means that everything has been hydrogenated. And if I hydrogenate double bonds, you may want to remember those double bonds disappear. So basically, perhydrophenanthrene is this molecule without all these double bonds, like so. And cyclopentano obviously means I have a cyclopentane attached to this perhydrophenanthine, giving us this very, very popular, well, at least very recognizable structure for the health uh, care sciences. And, of course, there are a lot of types of sterols. I think the first one that would come to mind is cholesterol, because in the first place, it's our sterol, although there are other sterols like ergosterol in fungi and various phytosterols in plants. Now, let's zoom in into cholesterol because it's such a very popular word, okay? This is the specific structure of cholesterol, and it's not like you're asked to memorize this. Hopefully, your instructor didn't ask you to, but well, at least I showed you the structure of cholesterol to first tell you that it has 27 carbons in total, and that it has an OH group, which of course makes sense because its suffix is OL. And despite the fact that people think of cholesterol in a bad way, well, a lot of people, I guess, it has a lot of uses, actually. Very important, very um, life-saving uses. First, cholesterol aids in membrane fluidity. Remember when I talked to you about phospholipids before? I mentioned that most of our cell membranes contain phospholipids like lecithin. But I didn't say that only phospholipids make up the cell membrane. 
because actually we can say that cholesterol is also part of the cell membrane and they regulate how hard or how fluid the cell membrane would be. Remember, in biology, a word that we always correlate with the cell membrane is the word semi-permeable, meaning that the cell membrane will allow the entry of some molecules but will not allow the entry of others. And how will we regulate what would come in and what would not come in? It would actually be governed by how fluid or how rigid that cell membrane is. And cholesterol is pretty much one of the main uh, players in that uh, aspect. Also, when I was discussing sphingolipids, I did mention that the myelin sheath is primarily made up of what we call sphingomyelin. But it is actually known that other than sphingomyelin, cholesterol is an important and critical, meaning it cannot be, it cannot be gone in the structure of myelin sheaths. Cholesterol is also the precursor of bile acids. We need bile acids because these so-called bile acids help in the emulsification of fats. Remember, in our stomach, the medium is aqueous. So meaning if, for example, we take in uh, healthy oils from our food, it's impossible for us to take it inside our body as long as those fats are never dissolved. And the solution for our body to take those oils in is to emulsify that. So by the help of our bile acids, we can successfully insert those dietary oils into our bloodstream. Without it, we'll just be excreting all of the fats we take in, you know, the next time we go to the bathroom. Now, we also have cholesterol as the precursor of steroid hormones. Honestly, these three steroid hormones should have, you know, a playlist of their own, considering how complicated they are in terms of their effects. But if you've heard of aldosterone, that's a mineralocorticoid. If you've heard of the stress hormone cortisol, that's an example of a glucocorticoid. And of course, I think, do I even need to write it? Testosterone and estrogens, or estradiol, are examples of sex hormones. All these big names, big hormones, very popular, I hope you're familiar with them also, come from cholesterol. And even one last thing, do you know that cholesterol is the precursor of vitamin D? Yes this vitamin D. And uh, actually, this happens by the aid of sunlight. That, that's why sometimes they call vitamin D the, you know, sunshine vitamin. It, it doesn't mean that the sun will give us vitamin D, uh, but it means that the sunlight will allow the cholesterol in our body to be converted to vitamin D. That's why, you know, th there's a problem with how we uh, define vitamin D. Isn't it that when you say vitamin, it's something that you cannot make? But it seems like we can make vitamin D because we have cholesterol. That's why a lot of people do not actually agree with calling vitamin D vitamin for the, in, in the sense that we cannot make it. But probably we just ended up calling it vitamin D because we were so used to it. Scientists were used to calling it like that for decades. It stayed like that. But it's well known that we categorize vitamin D more of a hormone today rather than a real vitamin. Now, one thing that we understand is that there are really bad things associated with cholesterol. That is undeniable. That's why people fear this word. Despite the fact that, you know, without these uses of cholesterol for us, we'd probably die on the spot. That is because sometimes, especially in excess, cholesterol can contribute to heart disease. Heart disease usually starts from atherosclerosis, where there are plaques that uh, uh, form in our blood vessels. And actually, atherosclerosis usually starts from excess of lipids in our blood, like cholesterol. And lipoproteins will help us understand this better. Now, lipoproteins are, as the name implies, complexes of lipids and proteins, which have the role of transport meaning they transfer lipids throughout our body. Just take note that most of our lipids are actually packaged and synthesized in the liver. And there are lipids that go out from it, going to our other tissues. And there are lipids from tissues going back to the liver. And depending on the lipoprotein, the direction would be this way or this way. Now, let me define first these things. The last letter L would always stand for lipoprotein, just so you know. 
The D here stands for density. Let me write that. And this means H, high density lipoprotein. This means low density lipoprotein. And this means very low density lipoprotein. If I ask you, what's the formula of density again? It's mass over volume, right? And what's the relationship of volume density? Inverse, meaning if I have high density, I have low volume, or if I have low density, I have high volume. That's why there's something in the way I drew them, right? They're not the same size. The high density one is the smallest in how I drew it, then the low density is larger, and then the very low density lipoprotein is the largest because it makes sense. Whatever has the lowest density should be the largest, has the largest volume, and whatever has the highest density should be the smallest. So uh, that's one message I would want to bring here. Now, other than that, the direction. Low density and very low density lipoproteins transport lipids from the liver to the adipose. What's dangerous there is that some of those may end up floating in the bloodstream and cause atherosclerosis. Is that good? Of course not, unless you want heart disease. Okay, and in general, we don't want disease in the medical setting, in the healthcare setting. That's why these two lipoproteins are called bad cholesterol. They kind of promote heart disease in some way. And HDL is called good cholesterol because they do the opposite of what these two perform. They, these HDL molecules take out excess lipids from bloodstream and other tissues and adipose and bring them back to the liver. And at least in the liver, it won't have a lot of chance to, well, to develop atherosclerosis. And that's what we want. So every time you hear of the words bad and good cholesterol, we're talking about specific types of lipoproteins actually. One last note. Is it actually accurate to use the words bad and good cholesterol? The answer to that is no, because in, for, in every type of lipoprotein, not only does it contain protein on top of just cholesterol, it also contains other lipids like triglycerides and phospholipids. So to say that you know LDL is a bad cholesterol is very inaccurate because it doesn't just have cholesterol, but it has so many things else on top. But again, I think people have become so used to calling these words are using these for terms that it has withstood the test of time. We should just be aware that they are used uh, in an inaccurate way.